Welcome everyone and thank you for taking time out to check out this very special interview with a true father figure of sound system culture and jungle drum and bass. My guest today is widely regarded as the absolute definition of a junglist soldier, a multi-genre, multi-award winning hit maker who has toured the world and appeared on builds with heavyweights such as James Brown and Lenny Kravitz and has also worked with the Freestylers and Asian Dub Foundation to name a few. He has four decades worth of history stored in his memory banks and I hope to extract some of that knowledge for music fans today, tomorrow and evermore. MC Navigator, welcome to the Odyssey. Thank you sir, the very big intro. Thank you. Nice one man. Excellent, thank you. Um, so let's get started at the very beginning. You were born in 1963, is that right? Correct sir. And society as a whole was very different in the 60s and 70s. So with yep. that in mind, what was it like growing up as a mixed race child in the 60s and 70s? Well, you know, um, speaking very frankly, it wasn't easy. And the reason was, the main reason is that at that time, mixed relationships weren't really accepted. They were very taboo, you know, whether it was a white woman or a white man with a black woman or a black man or whether it was an Asian person with a white person or whatever, it wasn't accepted. Okay. So you could imagine me being a child born from a, res uh, a relationship like that. It was like, you know, I was the result of something that wasn't accepted. So therefore it was, it was a difficult time coming up in that time. So, um, you weren't really accepted by black or white. You were sort of just out there, you know, weird, no nation. Who are you? What are you? You know, them, them type of um, stupid little comments, you know. And and when you're growing up, um, not forgetting the fact that the first six years of your life is very, very influential, it actually sets you up for, to be a human being and to be an adult. The first six life, so, so, sorry, the first six years of your life are the most influential, and they they set the tone for the way you're going to carry on in your life. And if you're being led to believe that you aren't accepted or that you're not normal, it makes you it makes it leaves you feeling very detached, ostracized, and um, discriminated discriminated against. And that's how I felt when I was young. So in school, like in school nowadays, it would probably be a proportion of fifty, maybe sixty percent of children could be of mixed heritage or mixed race what was it like for school and like i'm talking school college those sort of times were you one of many or were you one of few i was the only dude that looked like me all the way from school in all of the schools i went to really okay there were mixed race guys but they were a lot darker than me i'm very light-skinned yes so a lot of my friends that were mixed race they had dark skin i have a brother same mother same father and he almost looked like an Indian. He had dark skin and very Indian looking hair. Okay. So they didn't really have him up the way they had me up because I was very light skin, almost white freckles, sort of like brownie ginger hair. There was nobody that looked like me in my school, all the way through school. From the time I started at infant school, right through to when I finished school, there was nobody that looked like me. Wow. Okay. So... I guess from a very, very early age, music has played a very influential part in your life. Who yeah. I read, I read one time, and I want to make sure this is right. I read one time that you checked John Lennon as an early musical influence. Is that right? Yeah. And what was it about John, influ John Lennon that influenced you? And who else did you like? And who else did you listen to growing up? Like, did that give you like a sense of belonging listening to this different type of music? No, no. The thing that really gave me a sense of belonging was Bob Marley. Okay. Bob Marley was mixed. And when I found out that Bob Marley, the king of reggae, was mixed, he had a white dad and a black mum. Yes. I was like, yo, you lot can't talk to me no more. Because the king of reggae is a mixed race. 
<laughs> you understand what I'm saying yeah, to you? Yeah, so that, yeah. It just put everything into context for me. I was a big Bob fan. Um, but, you know, going through school, I never really got any attention from the teachers. I was a very, very bright boy. Going all the way to school until I got to the last school, where, you know, like the last senior high, the last two years of school. Mm -hmm. That's when they put me in the bottom classes. Because I used to play with all the black men then. Because I felt a part of the black community because my father was a black man. And when my mother married my father, the whole of my mom's family cut her off. So therefore, I never grew around no white people. I didn't know none of my white side of my family. I just grew around the black people. And if I'm honest with you, my first musical influence was my dad's music. And what was it that your dad used to listen to? Ah, oh, my dad. I mean, mainly it was like ska, Loopy, Rocksteady. But he would listen to all different types of music, like, I don't know, Brooke Benton, Diana Washington, Nat King Cole, Fats Domino, you know, them type of artists. Wow. Um, I can, I can like, I can see, I know all the words to some of them songs, even up to now. I've never, I haven't heard their music there since I was a kid, and I can tell you, I can recite them songs. So the thing with John Lennon was, I just liked the fact that he was about peace and love. Yes. And, you know, Imagine was like something that encaptured my mind. It was just like, imagine all the people living as one. No this, no that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, they said, they said, they may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. You know, and I, I it's, them things used to give me goosebumps listening to it because I used to be like wow and it was such a simple song it was nothing but a piano riff yes there was no drums there was no guitar riff it was just this pretty little piano riff that was just kind of just like I don't know man it was crazy man I just those are my two favorite songs Imagine and Redemption song because even with Redemption song it was just like they you know he he told the story of what it was like yep. in Jamaica before independence and all of these things. So that all resonated with me on a big scale. But, you know, my dad's music, what I first listened to, the most influential album in my life is an uh, album called Tighten Up Volume 1. You need to go and research that album. Is that it's actually a compilation. Is that it's Studio actually... One? No, nah, man, this is before Studio One. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is before Studio One, you know, and songs like Kansas City on there and watch this sound, you know. Come on, you stop, children. Watch this set. Do 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 do. It was still it was still borderline rock steady and scar, but it was it was just starting to lean towards reggae. So actually when I was born and I was growing up as a little boy, there was no reggae yet. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I watch reggae creep in. Wow. So with reggae coming in, that actually comes into the next question that I have for you, which is sound systems, which... So would you say the sound... Okay, what I'm asking you is, sound systems were very or extremely popular in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Can you explain to the listeners exactly what is meant by sound systems and why it's so important within the community. Okay, so if you could imagine the Second World War, all these people got killed. England is in a recession. They need to rebuild the country. So they start bringing people in the country, West Indians, Indians, Greek, Cypriot, whatever, you know, Turkish, all these people started to get brought into the country to help rebuild the country. So in the West, in the terms of a West Indian, um, sound system, uh, music, actually, music was the thing that kept everybody together. It formed a community. So because at that stage in the UK, a black man, couldn't get a club to play in or even get into a club, mm -hmm. they used to keep a lot of house parties. 
and the house parties would have all this music playing, they'd have a little set in there. Sometimes we just playing off a gramophone, but you know, a lot of the times they would have a little sound system in there and yeah, they would play music and it was more of a community thing. Even up until, you know, the eighties to the late eighties, it was still a very community based affair sound system. The other day I was at a funeral and I was there with all these people who are around my age and I was looking at everybody and I was like, you know what, we're the last of the old guard here, mate. Once we are gone, that's it. Because there is no community no more. You know, the community now is online. You know, you know, they, back then people followed their sound system, a sound will play against a sound. I'm talking about in the 80s now when I got into sound system. But before that, there was all these, you know, there was Count Suckle, there was, there was um, Count Shelley, there was Sir George. Um, Sir Lloyd, all these, all these old sound systems that used to play, <coughs> yeah, Sky Rock, Steady, Blue Beat, and sort of the early Studio One stuff. So that's where it all came from. And then after that, um, the reggae came in, but it kind of went rootsy, it was dub, you know. And then you had people like Shaka, um, Sofano B, Moan Bassa, Fat Man, Coxon, you know, these sound systems. Channel One was about them times as well, you know. These sound systems were the roots dubbed sound systems and that's where I cut my teeth on sound system. I used to actually, I didn't even even chat on sound in times there. I used to go to the parties and I used to wait outside for the van to turn up and then I'd help to lift the boxes in. And then I'd stand in there after I lifted the boxes in and wait to see if they'd let me stay in. Oh, that's wow. how I used to get into the dances. Okay. Yeah. I know they have the thing about the thing about stringing up where they wire everything up. Did you used to get involved yeah, yeah. in anything like that? Of course, you know, I mean, when I first got involved in sound systems, and I went to the first place where a sound system was stored, it was like stored in somebody's house in a back room. And when you went in there, you saw boxes, speaker boxes being half built. You'd see them with valve amps, they'd be building the, the valve slave amps themselves. They would build the preamp themselves, the equalizer themselves. They had circuit boards and capacitors and resistors, and they'd solder them onto the circuit board. And then after that, they'd make an aluminium cover to go over the top of it. And then they'd make the little stems to go onto the, the volumes and the bass and the treble. And then they put the knobs on me. I saw them actually build the sound system from nothing. So when you're talking about sound system in the context of how I know sound system, everything was handmade. It was all customized. Every single sound sounded different to each other. Every single sound had their own frequency and tone of bass line, mid range, treble. The boxes would look a certain way. They'd have their names either spray painted on or even cut into the wood. You know, it was it was a it was a very unique, special era. You know, you had you had to be very good to get on the mic because they weren't allowing your quality controls of the ultimate importance at them times there because there was a certain stigma that was attached to sound system and chatting on the mic. You know, you had to have dub plates. To be in the top flight, you had to be saying something otherwise, you know, or you had to have an energy about you or you had to have something going on that was different from everybody else that, that made you stand out. You know, so that's how I came up in the sound system world. And that started for me in 1979 when I was 16, when I left school. So I don't know how controversial this question would be, but who had the best beeline that you can remember in those days? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in the dub days, it was definitely a guy called um, Jatubis. It was a white guy called Keith. Okay. And, um, he was the first man that had like, integrated circuits in his amps and everything. So it was very high quality, stereo almost um, quality sound system. And when my man used to drop bass, boy, when him drop bass, trust me, the water all was shape. Yeah. Everything shape. This is, we have, you have to understand, this is way before any sound restriction, noise, noise pollution act and all of this. This is way, way, way before that. So then time that there was no, there was no limits. When it's a place out loud, you could hear the sound from miles away because it was so loud. Which reminds me of Jamaica because it's the same thing in Jamaica. A party will be keeping and you hear them two miles away over the hill. You, you know, when the night time comes, you put your clothes on and you walk in the direction of the sound system. <laughs> Even if you're not going to go into the yard, you just stand up on the road and you buy a drink and you did the IRF, you know, you listen to music and go and rave. You know what I mean? 
very, okay. very community based thing, a sound system. So know? just you know, you just talk about jar tobies there. Now you make a really good point about the whole thing about you know, like sound limitations, this, that, and the other. But so what kind of because I I have an interest in sound system, so what kind of like you know like you're talking about your bass bins how many bass bins were there and like you know like what kind of inch subwoofers are we talking about here you got any idea yeah of course so we, yeah. Have, um, we used to have you know celestian speakers and goodman they were the they were the top makes which ones are they celestian celestian okay and goodman you know look them up they're old school things, man. 200 yeah. watt speakers, and you'd have four of that. You'd have a quad box with four 18 inch 200 watt speakers in one box. So that's 800 watts pushing out of one speaker box. And in most cases, you'd have four or five sections in there with. Wow. Minute, yeah, it was a it was no joke thing, man. Some nuclear power thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when that B line that drops, is, that, that is, trust me, when them man they drop B line, man, everything shake. God, my shot the window don't break. That's how much B line used to be pulsating out of them boxes, you know. Special times, mate. Trust me. Have you? So I'm, um, I'm assuming. Do you sort of keep close to the sound systems of today? Well, put it this way: I know everybody in. I know all of the man them from back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I know most of the new school man them. And when they see me, like the other day I was doing an Asian party and I see Shawnee being there from Radio One. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he saw me, big smile on his face and I walked over, I shook his head. Oh, well, I go, I shiny. Yeah. And the man's just looking at me, shaking his head. He said, Navi, I go on you. I go on you, Demon, Flinty, Tipper, you know, Tenor Fly, Daddy Freddy, this, that, that. You know, that was that era of MCs and that was that era of sound system that all of these kids at that stage were listening to. And we were the top boys, you know. It's like it would be almost similar to how Jungle and Drum and Bass is now or Grime, you know, or even the Afro beat thing. It's just like that was the thing at that time. So, yeah, that's how it was, man. Wow. Okay. So here's a question for you. How did you become involved in sound systems? And tell us about who Festus Irie is. Right, so I grew up in East London, in a little village called Walthamstow. Okay. And and when I left school, well, just before I left school, I started, I actually started doing it. The other day I was speaking to my mum and I said, it's 40 years this year, you know, mum. She was like, no, it ain't. It's more than 40 years. I was like, eh? she was like, yeah, because I remember when you were 13, 14, you come home with your ghetto blaster, and you're joking your mic, yeah, and turn me crazy with your blasted music and chatting all over the thing. So she said, you were doing it way before you even got on the sound system. I was like, wow, look at that. I even <laughs> forgot that. So I joined a little sound system in Walthamstow called Intruder. Okay. And um, same thing, I was, you know, a little bit sort of like outsider, wasn't really accepted. But one thing, you know, something called a chat mic, you know, and people used to read me for that. So I said to myself, all right, then let me just go around and see if I can do a little thing on it. Anyway, one time now they get booked down Hackney in a place called Holly Street. There was a community centre down there called Holly Street in Hackney. And they used to have dances there every Friday night. There was a big sound down there called Surge. And they used to play in their resident every week. And they'd play with this other sound called Black Sapphire. And somehow... This little intruder sound from Wolfenstone managed to get a date in there to play with these two big sounds. Okay. But Intruder never had enough boxes to cover the hall. So the guy that owned Intruder, his sister, used to see some guy in Tottenham and they had a sound called Phase One and they, they were a bigger sound. They had more equipment. So basically, Intruder borrowed Phase One sound that night to play that hall. So when I turned up at the party um, and I walked up to the sound, I see a bad man around the sound that I don't know. So I'm like, who the hell is all these people? Mm -hmm. um, so I walked up to the sound and I saw the guy that owned Intruder sitting at the back, kind of like with his head down. So I said, why isn't he playing the sound? So the guy that was playing the sound said, I'm afraid him, I go blow the speaker at him and him don't want to blow the speaker at them and I pay no money. So me, I play the sound. So I said, so can I chat on the mic? He said, yeah, man, this is Intruder. He said, you know, we're borrowing, you're borrowing phase one's boxes. So jumped on the mic. And, you know, when you're playing three sound, everybody would either play five tunes each or you play for a half an hour each or whatever. So we play our half an hour, whatever, five tunes, whatever. Yeah. 
and me done and then yeah the first one man them come to me they're like yeah oh you're good in a youth you know you can you can dj they liked it you know so um Fresco Sairi, <laughs> the guy named um roland glasgow he just took to me straight away and he was like yeah the next time when we sign on yeah i'm gonna chat with you so after that, me and him started chatting together because all the men them from Wolfram Store that was supposed to be on the sound never turned up. I was the only one that turned up. Okay. So then, so I'm chatting now with Roland, Festa Sairi. And when the dance done, I helped them to carry the boxes back into the van. And then I asked the guy that was, there was two guys that was running the sound, Roland and Otis. And I said to Otis, like, I'd like to join the sound. And, you know, um, we went back to the, the shed, packed out the boxes. And he was like, yeah, man, Sunday we're doing a big dance over in Wood Green Art Centre. He said, just turn up and, um, and you can chat. And that was kind of the start of me being on a big sound. That was 1980. Wow. Okay. And then, I, and then I basically moved to Tottenham after that. I moved from Wolfenstone to Tottenham because I wanted to be involved in that sound. And I, they were playing out regular already. They were doing house parties, birthday parties, christening, wedding, social club, community centre, church hall, school hall. You know, they were playing in St Albans, um, Bridget Road International Centre, right across the road from um, from the police station. We were playing against a big sound called Small Axe from Jamaica. Like, you know, I was, I was up there in the big league from I was 16 years of age, you know. So that was a, that sound, they, was, they were well known and people knew them all over the, the place. And they were like, there was two big sounds in Tottenham at that time. It was us and an next sound called Heavyweight. So we were kind of rivals. So yeah, I was in that league when I came to Tottenham. I so was straight into the big league kind of thing. On, on the second tier down, because you had bigger sounds than that. You had the Coxons and the Fatmans and, you know, the bigger sounds like Shaka and all of these sounds. But there was these, a, a, a tier lower. Okay. That was still big sounds. That would still play like, you know, Pop Wars and all of these places. But they just never had the power that the big sounds had. So how did you and the Ragga Twins link up? Right. Well, I think the first person I saw was D-Man. Okay. Um, Tuesday nights, there used to be a session in Tottenham at this place called Compton Crescent Lecture Hall. And it was, it was actually a lecture hall. It was a lecture hall and this guy called Jamarcus, he had a sound. And um, he used to play there every Tuesday. From 7 till 12, 7 in the evening till 12. And I remember going there one time and I see Demon on the mic. <laughs> he had a lyrics. They go again. The meaning. He had a lyrics saying, The meaning. This are the meaning. The meaning. The Maracas are the meaning. The meaning. You know? They yeah. said, The meaning for this and said that, that, that. And the meaning for this, so that, and that, that. You know? And I can't remember the actual lyrics, but it was sick, sick thing. And I was just looking at it. I was like, Yo, this guy is heavy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, um, we became friends, you know. He liked what I was doing anyway. I liked what he was doing. Um, this must have been about 82, 83. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, I know them man there 36, 37 years, man. Wow. And then um, after that, I met Flinty and his brother. Yeah. I think they were all still going to school then. I must have been about 18, 19 but they're slightly younger than me. I think Flint is like three years younger than me and Demon's maybe two years younger. So, you know, I think Demon had left school, but Flint and then was still going to school, man. Okay. They used to come and dance in their school uniform and then, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Took off the jacket and put it in a bag and put it in put, put on a, you know, whatever thing, you know what I mean? And got chat mic, you know what I mean? So I know them guys a long, long, long time, man. Long time. And then as things went along, um, D-Man got onto Unity and then he brought in Flinty and there was another guy that used to spell with us named Sean Major. Rest in peace, my brother. You know, he died a couple of years ago from cancer. Okay. Um, that was, that was one of my bony fire, bony, bony fire bridging. But I met them, all of these men, I met when I moved to Tottenham because Tottenham, as a matter of fact, D-Man and Flinty and all them men, there was Hackney man and Stokey man. They weren't even Tottenham man. But there was dances keeping all over the area and everybody would go everywhere. Nowadays, you can't even do that, you know what I'm saying? But everybody would go everywhere and you play sound. And so, you know, um, Unity, I think D-Man joined Unity around 83, 84. 
and then I came along, say, around 85. Um, and then it was me, Demon, and Flinty at one stage, man, and we was like, yeah, we was running North East London, like, seriously. We was the hottest thing in North East London, man, at that time. So would, you know, with the three of you, because even to this day, you have, like, this chemistry, telepathy, connection, like, did you guys ever used to, like, spend time together, like, creating lyrics? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, exactly that. Um, being on Unity, you couldn't go up there and chat head top all night. Okay. And when I say head top, I mean freestyle. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you got to be just like, you know, between me and you're just, you're just rhyming. You're just rhyming. But with Unity now, there was a standard to the way how you did the mic thing. You had to write lyrics. And... D-Man was already on that tip, and so was Flinty. I wasn't. So when I joined the sound, I wrote two lyrics. I did my audition, and Rib said, yeah, come down to four aces on a Friday night, which was like the hottest spot then. Mm-hmm. Um, Unity was resident in there, four aces down also, which, is, which some people might know as Labyrinth. Okay. Back in the day, early rave days, because after the whole sound system thing done, in the late 80s going into the early 90s, the jungle thing and the house thing, um, the acid house thing came in and then the hardcore and that. So they were doing all some different, you know, some different music in there then. But when I went there, it was strictly reggae dancehall. And in 85, we had the beginnings of digital reggae dancehall. So that would be slang thing. Yeah, slang mm-hmm. thing, bass line, in case anybody don't know, is do 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 That's from 85. You know, reggae was the first musical format to really go digital. And that was the wave that Lee Demon and Flinky rode and became household names in the UK. You know, so we used to go to D. I I used to go to Demon's house, his mother's house, and we used to sit in the bedroom and write combination lyrics. If I wrote, I used to have, he used one, one other dance about the cemetery. Me have a dance about the super hero. And the other one have a dance about the car showroom. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then when you chat your lyrics and the crowd love it and they start to make noise and you rewind, you give the mic to the next man. And then he comes in with his, start, his, his version of that same lyric. So we used to have loads of combination lyrics like that. So it just got to a stage where we could even do it freestyle because we were so used to what we were doing. You know, in 1987, we won Best Sound System, Black Echo's Best Sound System Award, 1987. That's the first award I ever won. Okay. <laughs> I was just about to ask you about that as well. So that's, so, because this is the thing that I don't really see that with a lot of others was, you know, sometimes when you guys would be doing the, the pass the mic hand to hand, sometimes it would be sentences, not like a 16 or an 8. It would literally be sentence, sentence, sent, just passing it on. And it's just like, well... That doesn't just happen overnight. So that's just that that practice that you guys would have constantly, I guess, then. Yeah. I think the one person who I remember the most that really kind of used to do that was Daddy Freddy when he first came to this country in 1985. Yeah. And he used to spar with Tenafly. Okay. So, you know, he'd be like, so this is Daddy Freddy, me the century, and then they give it to Tenafly. Tenafly said, so me and Tenafly, me had a reporter, man. And then, and then, and then, you know? and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. One line, one line, one line. And we always used to get, like, Freddy was a man, like, he was very friendly to all of the UK guys. So when he would go to a dance, he would just say, yo, dance, I keep over this, you know, so, you know, so everybody have to come, come DJ the mic with me, you know. So when you got baby, at 10 MCs around the mic. And, you know, so that everybody got a chat. He'd make everybody chat together. You'd have 10 men up there going line for line for line. Wow. You know, and that's how we grew up in the music industry. So it wasn't hard for me and D-Man and Flinty because we was already writing lyrics together and doing that thing from way back. Remembering that we started off listening to Jamaican sound system tapes. That's how we learned how to DJ on the mic, how to host the set, you know? When I say host, you, you host over the over the part one, you play the the, 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 the vocal version. Mm-hmm. And then when it gets to a certain stage, the rhythm is a pull-up selector, and then you like play the part two, and then you play the um, instrumental. And then that's when we'd get busy on the mic. So, you know, we learned that from the Jamaican sound systems. Obviously, growing up with my dad from... 
Rocksteady, Blue Beat, Scar, Studio One, Duke Creed, Sir Cox and Dodd, all them labels. And then coming into the early dance hall in 1980, after the dub era in the 70s, you had people like Dennis Brown, Sugar Minot, um, Gregory Isaac, Barrington Levy, Johnny Osborne. All of these type of singers were the hot names at that stage. Yeah. Um, and that's when our era, our era of MCs started to take over because before us, there were some other guys. But then we used to chat like how we did. We kind of took it to another level and started writing lyrics, you know. 